and he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast, and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Who's that praying? Jesus. Right? That's in the Garden of Gethsemane. This is the last part of his life. And what was Jesus doing? <laughs> he was relying on his Father to help him out through this. Go ahead, Ray. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Mm. The more you rely on his grace, wisdom and power, the more you will be imitating the Lord Jesus. If Jesus had to pray and concentrate on that prayer so hard that his blood came out in the sweat, what does that say for us when we deal with conflict? When we deal with trials and problems? Okay. Turn real quick to Psalm 119, verse 67. It's a small verse. Tom, will you read that for us? Psalm 119, verse 67. He's looking for that. Think about this as he reads this. It says, when you are squeezed through controversy and these sinful characteristics are brought to the surface, you will have an opportunity to recognize their existence and ask for God's help in overcoming them. Tom, you got that verse? Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. You understand what that verse is saying? Before I was what? Before I was afflicted, I went astray. When I went astray, then I became afflicted. Now my thoughts are on your word. You guys get that? Yes. Yes. Does God use personal affliction and pain in your life to bring you back to Him yes. and keep you focused on Him? Yes. That's one of the greatest tools yes. that He has. Amen. Amen. There is more to being like Jesus than simply recognizing weaknesses and confessing sin, however. To grow, you must also draw on His grace and practice new attitudes and habits. Just as athletes develop their muscles and skill through strenuous training, you will see greater growth when you repeatedly think and behave properly in response to challenging circumstances. For example, when people provoke and frustrate you, practice love and forgiveness. When they fail to act promptly, develop what? Patience. Patience. Okay? When you are tempted to give up on someone, exercise faithfulness. Conflict provides a rich mixture of such trials, each of which can strengthen and refine our characters. The next thing I want to look at is what we call the four G's, and that is the four ways to glorify God. Alright? Turn to 1 Corinthians 10.31. We won't get through these. We'll do just follow the two of them. 1 Corinthians 10.31. Do any of you know what this verse says before you actually get to it? Okay? Therefore, whether you eat or whether you drink, and whatever you do, do all what? To the glory of God. Okay? Four G's. Glorify God. How are we to glorify God? And when are we to glorify God? We are to glorify God, and not only, Adventist, what you eat and what you drink, but in what? Everything that you do. Does that pretty much cover every moment that you are awake to the time you go to bed? Okay, so in everything that you do, you are to do it to the glory of God. Glorify God. Motivated and guided by a deep desire to bring honor to God by revealing the reconciling love and power of Jesus Christ. That's the first way we glorify God. Okay? Let's turn to Matthew 7, 5. 
This has to do with dealing with conflict. And this is why most conflict continues to go on. Ray and I still have this conflict over the color of the church. I think Ray is wrong. And I have gone to all the people I know who will agree with me in the church to let them know that Ray is wrong in this. Because we're going to have a church board meeting and we're going to vote on this. And Ray's wrong. <laughs> and if I can get enough people on that church board to see that I'm right, they'll vote that I'm right. Right? So I do my best to make sure I go to all those people. Is that the biblical way to handle this conflict? No. no. Okay? Now you see, I don't really want to talk to Ray because I'm afraid of Ray. You know? I want Ray to still like me. I just don't like his colors for the church. So I'm kind of afraid to talk to Ray. But I'm not afraid to talk to the other people that I know will vote my way. That's pride. That's arrogance. And that is an unchristlike uh, state and set. So Matthew 7 5. What does Matthew 7 5 say? Carl, you got that? Can you read that for me? Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye. Who? And then shalt thou see clearly cast out the moat out of thy brother's eye. Uh, okay, what's a beam? <laughs> oh, great it's a great big log. What's a moat? A little splinter, right? Okay, now, what is Jesus saying and what's the context of this? This is the context of going to a brother and telling him his fault. You're wrong, and this is why you're wrong. What does Jesus say? Jesus says the thing that's wrong with your brother is he's got a little splinter in his eye. And you cannot go to him until you take that big old log out of your own eye. Let nothing be done through strife or what? Do you know what that word means? It's a whole word. Pride. Right? That is the biggest problem that we as fallen human beings have, and that is the issue of pride, right? That's exactly it. I mean, these things you're talking about are tools. Yes, the root of the problem is pride. Yes, it's always the problem. It's Satan's problem, and it's our problem today. And yes, the reason all yes. sin is there, it's pride. Very well said. So listen, do you understand that pride is like the locomotive of a train? And there's a lot of cars that it carries behind. Okay? There is anger, dissension, uh, what's that? Resentment, bitterness, murder. Now, nobody here in the church will murder each other. But what's gossip? Right? Have you ever wondered how the early Christians or the Christians through the Middle Ages, the Dark Ages, were able to sacrifice their lives, were able to watch as they sacrificed their families' lives to stay true to Jesus Christ. They had an understanding of Him, and they had a commitment to Him that in our day is sometimes hard to find. But there will come a time, the Bible promises us, the last church in the book of Revelation, in the first three chapters, there's seven letters to the seven churches. What's the last church there? Laodicea. Laodicea. Who is that church? That is the church of the last day, is that right? So if you believe that you're living in the last day, the church of Laodicea would be you. It would describe the church. But you know that the church of Laodicea, that's said to be lukewarm, it's neither hot nor cold, also has a double meaning, it's also the church that overcomes. Because if there's no eighth church, what church does Christ come back for? It's the church of Laodicea, right? It is a church that finally takes the biblical advice, buys the healing balm that Christ offers, sees itself for who and what it really is, and gives its full heart to Christ, and it becomes the perfect bride that Jesus is able to come back for. Mm -hmm. Now what part of Laodicea do you want to be? The first
first phase or the second phase. I want to be the second phase. The church that overcomes. How are we to overcome? And it's what Ray just talked about. It is to be able to humble ourselves and overcome our own pride. Brothers and sisters, if you cannot reconcile within the family of God, what hope is there for us to actually become the bride of Christ? So, get the log out of your eye, face up to your own contributions to a conflict before you focus on what others have done. Now, have you ever dealt with people who, while you're trying to deal and work conflict out, all they see is what the other person or what all these other people have done to them? And you can talk to them dozens of times and all you get is what people have done to them. What is this word here? That's what you can see it? Accountability. You could put self in front of that and that would be self-accountability. That would be face up to your contributions to whatever conflict that you're dealing with. I have hardly ever been, well, you know, personally myself, I've never been into a conflict where I didn't play some type of part. Okay? And I've hardly seen any conflict where it was all one-sided. Okay? And I'm trying to say, I don't think, I don't think I've ever actually experienced a conflict where there wasn't both parties that were involved in that conflict. The original conflict may have been one-sided, but the reaction to that conflict now has become both people. You have to face up to your responsibility to whatever conflict that you're in. And if you're able to see your side, then you have something that you can negotiate Amen. with, right? Amen. Because, let me ask you a question. How many of you want to go into a... Uh, an arbitration, a mediation, or a negotiation, and you're only going to want to hear that people tell you everything you've done wrong. How well is that negotiation going to go? Okay, well, what do you think they're thinking if you're the one going in there and all you want to do is express what they've done to you? Okay? I'm going to tell you that the world is not just against you and it's everybody if, if your life is where all these things happen and everybody's against you everybody's not against you you have a personal accountability in all this and you have to be able to see it because nothing will change until you do see it you got to see your part okay so get the log out of your eye face up to your own contributions to a conflict before you're able to focus on what others have done once you get to this point, then you can get to step number three in glorifying God, and that is gently restore, and that's what we'll pick up next week. Our closing hymn this morning is hymn number 251.